Friends, we are uh, a church that meets together usually at three different locations, but at Easter, we gather as one church. And it's this big, super fun event. And I know several of you, most of you, some of you, have been at Easter events in the past. At our most recent Easter service, we heard the testimony of a member of the gathering whose name is Elizabeth Sidwell. And Elizabeth is pretty inspiring. She's a power lifter. And her story and her faith have really encouraged a lot of us. And our pastor of group formation, her name's Charity Goodwin, she recently went out for coffee with Elizabeth, both just to check in and say hello, but also because Charity is interested in kind of growing stronger and getting healthier. And so she asked Elizabeth, look, how do I begin to get strong and to lift at your level? Now, Elizabeth recommended something that was pretty surprising. She said, practice doing the lifts, but without any weights. That's what Charity said too. Really? So I want you to pretend with me, like you're lifting a bar. Lift this up. Pretend. Sometimes your, your brain sort of makes you feel like something is happening, but you know nothing is happening at the same time, right? It's interesting to do, but many of you are probably saying what Charity was saying. Why am I doing this? Why am I practicing and using my imagination when I want to get stronger? It seemed a bit silly to Charity. It might seem silly to you. Why not just jump right into it? Why would you ever want to pretend while you practice? If you've been with us during the last eight weeks, you've probably noticed that we've been talking a lot about faith practices. And at the gathering, we have six shared practices that we encourage each other to take part in. They're pray, serve, worship, grow, give, and invite. And when the church began, our lead pastor, Matt, he had a lot of people approach him after worship, and they asked some version of this question. Look, you talk a lot about following Jesus, but how do we do that? Like, how do we practically take steps to follow Jesus? What do you need to do to be a follower of Christ? And our six shared practices are kind of our answer to that question because practices are simply the things we do that bring us close to Jesus and close to each other. So if you want to know what we're about here at the gathering, or even if you just missed a week or two of the last eight weeks, I encourage you to check out those sermons about our practices on our YouTube page. They're worth your time. You can subscribe. You can catch up with other sermons. You can even share them with friends as well. And we focused upon these six shared practices because they are the ways in which we live into our mission, which here at the gathering is to invite new people to become deeply committed followers of Jesus. So in today's message, I'm going to try my best to bring all of these shared practices together. It's like a culmination of the sermon series, no pressure, and I'm excited to share it with you. But it can't be just about saying what we believe and then showing up somewhere for an hour on Sundays. We're called to be more than just believers. We're called to be practitioners of faith, to live it out during the other 167 hours of your week, not just that one hour at 9.30 or 11 o'clock on a Sunday morning. And I honestly, I hope that you are discontent with simply believing things about God and about Jesus. Instead, I hope that you'll work toward being people who live and act in such a way that other people are able to tell that God and Jesus, that we are created out of love, that those things matter deeply to you, that they shape and impact your life. That is my hope. The scripture we're going to explore today is from 1 Timothy chapter 4. It invites us to train in godliness So let's hear what this says. Train yourself in godliness. For while physical training is of some value, godliness is valuable in every way, holding promise both for the present life and for the life to come. This saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance. In other words, pay attention. This is important. For to this end we toil and we struggle because we have our hope set on the living God who is the Savior of all people especially of those who believe. This letter is an encouragement. And I don't think it's just an encouragement for the people that it was written to, but it's also an encouragement to us today, to anyone who wants to follow Jesus, to train in godliness, to practice godly actions, to live in godly ways. Because when we do that, it transforms our lives right here and now, but also, as you've heard, it transforms the life to come. I think that's pretty clarifying for me. I hope it is for you too. Because it is way too easy 
to hold a view of the Christian faith where if you just believe the right things, I'm talking about, I've, I've got my check, my check boxes that I'm filling out. Belief, doctrine, got it, got it, got it. If you check those right boxes, even if your life doesn't actually reflect those beliefs at all, even if you're treating other people horribly or embracing cruelty towards yourself or the world around you, there are people who believe, well, if I believe the right things, the living out doesn't really matter. But here the Apostle Paul reminds us that the ways in which we practice the life of Jesus here and now in this life, that's what gives not only us, but everyone around us a glimpse of what a godly, holy, Jesus-centered life actually looks like. Yeah, we might all believe the right things, but can anyone actually see that our hope is set on God and that Jesus actually makes a difference in our lives? Can they see that? That should be a sobering question for y'all, because I know it is for me. Now this training, this practice of godliness, it isn't a goal that we can accomplish on our own. Everyone falls short of the glory of God. Everyone, all of us, we need God's help. In order to follow Jesus, to become like him, we need the help of someone else. We need God's help, the Holy Spirit's help. And we become like Jesus by doing what he did, which is why we have these practices. But even as we practice them, we can't do any of this by ourselves. We need God at work in our lives. And I don't think it's just in isolation. I think God is at work in our lives through one another, in Christian community, in all of the ways that the Holy Spirit shows up and works in and through us to transform us. And as we, with God's help, take part in these practices, as we do all the things, what we'll find is that internally, I'm talking about within ourselves, in our heart of hearts, We are being changed. We will become more loving, more kind, more joyful, more peaceful, gentle, patience. We'll begin to develop healthy self-control. Because friends, if there's one thing that I have found about the faith journey, it's that what is on the inside eventually comes out. This means that you you can know and understand Scripture. You can understand historical context. You can understand the languages of the Bible, Hebrew and Greek, with all of the brilliance of your mind. But if your heart remains cold and malicious and manipulative, that's what will come out. It'll show up. That is what others will experience when they encounter you. So as we talk about practices, it's a cautionary tale. Yes, do them. Take part in them because they're worthwhile. But then also be mindful and be prayerful and say, how am I gradually being changed within my own self, in my heart, in my mind? How do I see the changes within me? Belief and action are transformative, but we have to embrace both of them together because that's where we become more like Christ. So if you want to be like Jesus, if you want the practices to be more evident in your life, you have to start and grow and stretch. So wherever you are with Jesus in the church, everyone has a starting place on the spiritual journey. I think deciding to begin is a huge thing. Taking a step, that is a powerful move. And it's important to remember, I think, because we can stay stuck in indecision if we're trying to figure everything out before we begin. You know what that's like. Or we can get stuck when we're trying to jump right into something at the advanced level. It's kind of like, with our friend who's the power lifter, if I just went into the gym and said, there's a 500 pound barrel, I'm gonna pick it right up, I'm gonna do this and I'll never move again because <laughs> it'll, it'll break something vital, whereas she could just go in and lift, right? We all begin somewhere. I wouldn't recommend starting there. And I laugh about that because I'm remembering how Charity said she felt when Elizabeth had said, you, you can't start lifting the big weights. You have to just do this without anything. You have to get into the motions without actually lifting any weight. And Charity was like, what are you talking about? I am kind of insulted. I can, I can do better than that. I'm strong in my own way. But Elizabeth, she wasn't trying to insult her. She just knew that to begin, to start well, we all need to learn the motion without adding all of the weight. And our faith, Just like our ability to lift heavy things, it needs to grow over time. So if we're just starting out, if you are just starting out on your spiritual journey, be kind to yourself. Don't judge your beginning. The book of Zechariah urges us, don't despise the day of small beginnings. 
To put it another way, it's better to have a day number one than to have a someday. The important thing is actually just to get started. At the beginning, friends, it is not a bad place to be. Instead, not beginning, not starting, that is the place you don't want to be. So we've got this, right? In order to grow stronger in your life of faith and practice, you need to start. It's only after you actually start that you begin to grow. And growth, this happens when we choose to be a bit more intentional and you begin to increase the frequency of your practice. Again, 1 Timothy reminds us of something that's key. It should drive us. For to this end we toil and struggle because we have our hope set where? On the living God. Faith is not something that's one and done. Gradually beginning to grow in these spiritual practices, growing in our spiritual life, it can't be something we do one time and then we're finished with. No, it's like physical exercise, physical health. It needs to be practiced again and again with slow changes over time. And Charity knows this because she's told me bit by bit she's been doing what Elizabeth has told her, but she's starting to add in little bits of weight. Not a whole ton, but gradually. And she's seeing herself grow stronger slowly over time. She's slowly growing and enhancing her practices and her routine. And in my own life, I can tell you, I'm seeing this play out in encouraging ways too. Some of you know that just over a year ago, my doctor told me plainly, and I mean, she was really plain. She said, if you don't make changes, your weight and high blood pressure are going to put you at risk of heart disease and diabetes. It's going to happen. You're this close. And I had no idea what I could do to change. So I've tried things. I've done things. And she said, let's be drastic for you. And she made some really big changes in what I was eating. Y'all, cheese is this gift from God. But I don't eat cheese anymore. Dairy is out the window for me. Bread is a beautiful thing. But sadly, I don't eat bread anymore. I'm talking that kind of level of drastic change. And I started doing it, and I felt my health getting better. And she said, just do this for 30 days. But I ended up saying, I don't really want to stop. And so I haven't. And I had to choose to begin making changes, to begin a different way of living. And I had to practice that way of living. And it's only now, and I'm talking a year later, that like charity, I'm beginning to enhance and grow my practices. I'm slowly beginning to run again, which is terrifying, because I haven't done that in almost 28 years. But I had to begin. I have to grow. When you begin something new, Sometimes it could be really comfortable to just stay right there at that point of newness because you feel pretty good about yourself, right? You've been able to handle making those beginning changes and you're getting encouraging results. Maybe people are noticing, you know, if it's physical health, you've begun to make a change and you're like, I, I did something different. I feel good about that. If it's spiritual health, you do it once in a while and you can officially say to yourself, yes, see, I am practicing a spiritual discipline. May not be every day, but I'm doing it, right? The Bible doesn't tell us just to begin. It calls us to toil, to labor, to begin to run the race that is set before us. And I know that isn't easy, friends. I ran around the block a couple of days ago and my ankles are still reminding me of that. <laughs> but I did it. And next time, it's going to hurt a bit less. I'll be able to do it more easily because I've grown in my practice. Here's another thing. Sometimes in order to grow... And I also know this personally. We have to give up something to make room for what we're focused on. Whether it's God or our doctor or someone else, sometimes we need to be encouraged really bluntly to move something over, to make room for something else, something new in our lives. And we need to be willing to respond, to say yes, to begin to step forward. We need to be willing to say, okay, you can move it over. I'm going to invite you. Let's try that together so you can practice. You can move it over. Come on, y'all. Let's be convincing. You can move it over. Now, I understand that can mean a lot of things for each of us. We've all got our stuff, so I'm going to name a few. And if you agree that God can move that thing over in your life to make room for growth and for newness, I invite you to respond to God, and you can say, you can move it over. My habits... You can move it over. My insecurities, you can move it over. My attitude, you can move it over. My plans, 
You can move it over. That was a hard one last service as well. Ooh, my schedule. You can move it over. This is the hardest one. My ego. You can move it over. Whatever it is, Lord, you can move it over. Anything that is not like you, Jesus, you can move it over. May God hear our prayer today. So we're invited to start the spiritual journey. We grow in that journey. And then we stretch. So again, here's 1 Timothy saying something to us. For to this end, we toil and we struggle because we have our hope set on the living God. Struggle is not a fun word. It's not something we like to admit. But if all of us sit down and look at each other and say, do you struggle? I think we're going to be honest. We know that struggle is real. And I think that's the case for whether people know Jesus or not. People are going through it. Somewhere along the way, this is really unfortunate, but it's true. Some version of pop culture Christianity has told a lot of people that if you're a Christian, you've somehow become a part of a protected class. These are people who never have to deal with being on the struggle bus because you know Jesus. Some of you may never have heard that, and I'm so glad because that seems much more real for you. But there's a lot of people who believe that. But it's a lie. Because when I look at the history of the church, when I look at the people around me, many in this room, some of the most mature and faithful people that I know are deeply familiar with struggle, with sickness, with loss. Some of the most mature and faithful people that I know have gone through it, or maybe they're going through it. Friends, to be a Christian is not a magic recipe for struggling less. It's about the hope that we now have during the struggle. It's about having and offering hope to other people in their time of struggle. And to do any of this, it requires risk and vulnerability and exposure. So I know to stretch is about doing something that might cost you. It means taking part in something that knocks you out of the easy rhythm and routine. To stretch, it shakes us up a bit. That can be scary. It can be intimidating. But you do it anyway. Remember our power lifter friend, Elizabeth? She's training right now for a competition. And she's on Instagram. Her daily posts are incredibly inspiring. They kind of make you feel like just watching her lift these weights I could do anything because you see her exercising and using this incredible strength that God has given her, that she's grown, that she's earned. And you do think like, well, maybe I could do big things too. But there's something else that I notice in Elizabeth's posts. She often shares a portion of the Bible. It's from Mark chapter 9. She's doing this incredible feats of strength. And she says, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. That's a definition of stretching, if I ever heard one. She's there. (laughs) I mean, she's doing it. She's lifting. She's training. She's preparing. She has officially moved beyond starting, right? (laughs) Like, she's through the growth. Now she's stretching. She's pushing further. But I love her honesty, and I love the honesty of that Bible passage. Part of her is all on board. She is ready. She believes she can do it. But Lord, there is a part of her that struggles to believe. Anyone who's a person of faith. And I'm talking, if you've been a Christian your whole life, if you are new to this thing and you just walked into the building today and you're like, I don't know anything they're talking about. It's super weird, but I'm here. All of us can get this. We can understand this in some way. Lord, I'm trusting you. But where I'm 100% not trusting you, can you help me trust you? Lord, I believe in you. But where it's really hard for me to believe in you, could you help me believe in you? The stretch, it honors both the work toward the thing, but also the lack of the thing. It acknowledges both the victories and the need for validation. It's the courage and the fear and everything in between. Elizabeth is making these stretches in her health and her faith. Charity's doing the same thing. I'm proud of her. I'm trying to myself. I can say officially I feel healthier. But my doctor, who's both really encouraging but also really honest, keeps telling me, look, you are my poster boy for what happens when people actually listen to me about their health. But you are not done yet. If you're ever in danger of feeling too full of yourself, just ask your doctor or your dentist if you've got it all together. You know, They will set you straight really quickly. Yeah. And they're right. Because I don't want to just lose weight. I want to be healthy. There's a difference. 
I want to be regular in looking at myself and giving thanks for my embodiment and, and trusting that even in this somehow, no matter where I am with it, God loves me deeply. That I can love others. That we can grow in health and wholeness together because of God at work in our lives. Lord, make room in my life for that. Help me to stretch beyond becoming complacent and comfortable with where I am because with God's help, I can always become healthier and more whole. And then I can help others, hopefully, to do the same. So that's my stretch right now. What's yours? What is your stretch? In what practices are you ready to step out of your comfort and even step beyond your strength into the strength of God? And this could be spiritual, it could be physical, it could be anything in between. What is your stretch? Because if you want to be like Jesus, we need to start, we need to grow, and we need to stretch. Now I'm talking to some of you, and you are like, I've done all of this. I'm in a good spot. Stretching is officially part of my regular life. That is awesome. Congratulations. I'm proud of you. Now, there's a challenge that I have for you. Make a point of supporting and mentoring and partnering with someone who is just starting or growing their journey of faith and change. Or... Maybe you know someone else who's in that stretching phase of their life, stepping into new arenas of faith and growth. Partner with them to encourage one another. You got this, I got this. Okay. Because we can't be a church where the people who are growing and stretching in their faith only focus on moving forward. Being a part of Christian community has to mean that we look forward and we look backward and we see who's beginning the journey, and we come alongside them and encourage them to hold with us onto the hope of the living God. That's who we have to be, because we're all on a journey, and we're all continuing to grow in that journey by God's grace until we are in glory, and we need to encourage one another along the way. Are you ready to start and to grow and to stretch in your life and your faith? That is the question that lies before you. And on your seats, Most of you already found it when you sat down. There's a faith and practice companion. This is a new tool from the church. It's going to help you to take part in these shared practices to grow in being like Jesus. And on one side, there's this short definition of each practice. And on the opposite side are the words start, grow, and stretch. And each practice has ways that you can start the practice, to grow in the practice, or be stretched in your life in that practice. The purpose of this companion is to help you assess, and to select, to act, to reflect. There's two challenges for you this week. I want you to review that companion and assess where you are with these practices in your life. Spend some time reflecting and even discussing with other people that you trust. This is where I think I am or where I might be. Then you choose one of them. Select an area, a practice to focus on through the end of the year. You can just pick one. And then reflect, and I mean in an ongoing way, say like weekly or twice a month, reflect how that practice is going for you. How are you feeling and experiencing an inner change because of it? And then I want you to talk about it with somebody else. Normalize conversations about your spiritual journey with other people, with friends, with your partner, with your spouse, with your core group, even by yourself. You can journal, you can reflect. And the second challenge is to take part in our upcoming faith in practice classes. This is the year of practices. We're not done talking about them. And you can learn more about the practice of growing in groups through the faith in practice class, which takes place on Saturday, October 19th. Pastor Matt is going to be sharing historical and biblical information about the role of growing in groups. That's in our denomination and for us today. Because it can make a massive difference in our faith lives. We're also going to practice being in a group that night. Now listen, friends, I love my role here at the gathering. I get to witness, I get to see and to hear firsthand how God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, is working in you, is transforming your lives. I get to hear those stories. It's a gift. I also get to hear how you're transforming the world around you through your circles of influence, how you're sharing that love, that peace, that patience, that joy. It is a beautiful thing. I'm proud to be a pastor of a church where we don't just believe in Jesus. We strive to be like him. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord, I am so grateful that your Holy Spirit is at work in each and every one of us. I say that with confidence. Whether we are people who are sure of our faith in you, whether we are people who are absolutely unsure, and we're just trying to figure out where we are, let alone what we believe. Your Spirit is at work in us. Your love is for us. Your table is open to us. 
Thank you for loving us as you do. We give you thanks. We give you praise. Amen.